Well, one of the most interesting and enjoyable rock books I've read for ages is Ian Hunter's book, Diary of a Rock and Roll Star, published by Panther. And it just happens that sitting next to me at this moment is Ian Hunter. Ian, welcome to the programme. First thing that I'd like to ask you about the book, really, is uh, the motivation for writing it. Why did you write it in the first place? <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I think looking back on it, why I did it was because I, I, uh, the group had just left uh, the DeFries stable and were rather angry and I was beginning to realise a, a measure of concentration and self-control was going to be required on the following album if we were to stay in the business at all and the next album was the Mott album so this book really was uh, me getting myself a bit organised instead of ambling aimlessly through life's passages and whatever <laughs> Who did you write it for? A horrible start Fun? Who did you write it for? Did you I write, write it for the it's corny, I know, but I, I hold very dear the people that I play to, especially the younger ones, you know, mm. and uh, I can't help it. I, I, that's who I wrote it for, because when I was like 15 and 16, I, America was this amazing place, and I still think it is to 15 and 16 year olds, especially the working class, lower working class, maybe never going to get a chance to get there. That's where I came from. I never thought I'd get there. And uh, there you go, that's why I wrote it. Mm. Because it's called Diary of a Rock and Roll Star. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's not the original title that you had for it, is it? Was it Rock and Roll Sweepstakes originally? Yeah. Well, I want to start at the time, but uh, <laughs> Panther, in their wisdom, said, "Look, man, if somebody's going to uh, look on a, on a newsstand in the morning on the way to work, unless we put something pretty dramatic on the outside, they're not going to bother to buy it." Hence the stuff on the back about. <laughs> it's well battered. It? Yeah, it's a good laugh here. It's. Uh, as well as the stars of Ian's personal friends, you know what I mean? Zappa. I met him once, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Is it literally, I mean, scraps that you were writing as you went round America? Yeah, morning, noon and night, you know. You get a bit of time here and there. If mm. you're sitting on a plane, if you're... If you're waiting for Stan to get the luggage together in the morning, yeah. you know, if, uh, if you're sitting backstage, maybe waiting for everybody else to get their sound checked on before it's your turn. There's always time, you know. Did you edit it or revise it much? Well, it was Charlie Gillett and this guy Sonny who came back to me with, like... I didn't originally put how it all would be financed. And also things like, um, who's Chris Blackwell? You put Chris Blackwell in the book, but... I mean, everybody in the business knows who Chris Blackwell is, but everybody north of Barnet probably doesn't, you know, unless they went into records, you know. Mm. So I had to put little descriptive things in, you know, about Chris Blackwell's the head of Island Records, you know what I mean? Mm. You didn't actually change anything at all, then? No, nothing at all. I couldn't have done, because it would have been come out of context, because uh, when it came to those little bits, it was like maybe three or four months later. And I was no longer on a tour, so therefore I couldn't get the same mood, you know what I mean? Mm. Ian, can I throw a couple of quotes at you for your comment in the sense in retrospect? Oh, yeah. Toss them across, I'll Okay, yeah. There's, there's uh, page 52, right, and we're talking about now something that you wrote towards the end of November 1972. Anybody who thinks musicians work barely an hour a day is a mug, right? I've worked 16 hours a day for Mott since Mott's creation, so I'll make Pete buff and funny. Mott's been our lives, our love life centres around it, inconveniences and long separations are demanded by it. And another one here, it may look flashy, but it's over and you're, you're finished before you know it. If you aren't already broken by one thing, it'll be another. They come and they go, is the old saying, and you see it. Eyes, record company eyes, promoters eyes, agents eyes, media eyes, they're all watching for that slightest slip which will get around like wildfire. If this sounds like self-pity, it's not meant to. You have to be realistic, and the rock business is a dirty business, full stop. I mean, that sounds changed... good, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has your opinion that changed since you wrote it? Yeah. No, no, because my philosophy that, that it's a loser's game doesn't stem from like material or whatever. It stems from, the, from like in any form of showbiz. I only ever remember the film The Entertainer. Yeah. Well, that's well, I, that's why I call rock. Uh, sooner or later, you've got to come to terms with the fact that you can no longer go on there and pose and prance about and, and uh, live it all out, you know. And it's been my life, and, and it will be my life for some time to come. But I can't help but looking forward to when I'm maybe 40 or whatever. Are we going to grow up like like the Black Blues artists grew up, or, or you know what I mean? Or are, are we? Uh, is everybody going to do four <laughs> quick steps and tangos all of a sudden? And, um, and put people like me out of business, and will I be digging holes in the road? I mean, you're constantly thinking about things like this, you know. Yeah. 
The other thing, I mean, the other, one of the things about the book that I like so much is the fact that it gives such an insight, really, as to what goes on behind the scenes of a tour. And if I can throw in, I, I know it's a bit laborious reading through it. There's a dispute between Blood Rock and ourselves over second billing. This is in St. Louis, that's the beginning of December. Now, this may seem petty, perhaps, flash to the reader, but illusion plays a large part in the game of rock and roll, and any guy in a band will tell you this is an important facet. The rows I've been through over billing in my life must be in treble numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there seem to be, actually, really, that you accounted for in the book, a fair number of hassles over that tour. I mean, that was at a certain stage, really, of much development. Are you still finding those kind of problems? Oh, yeah. Well, I, th I found them when, I, when um, I can remember in Northampton when I was, like, in semi po band. This guy, Freddie, you know, uh, the, the scene was at St Michael's Village Hall, where, like, the top group got six quid, and the second on the bill got eight quid, <laughs> you see? Because, like, you got top billing in the Conical and Echo. Yeah, right. Right? And it's been <laughs> like that ever since. Like, <laughs> Especially in America, you've got to be top of the bill to create what you want to put across. Um, you must be top of the bill, because you can't work with other people's PAs on a one-nighter. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It's very difficult for, for a, a new band, especially more now than when we started, because the equipment is so sophisticated. It's like I talk also in the book about Roxy supporting Jethro at Madison Square right. Garden. Yeah. Well, that was a typical example that the guys didn't get a sound check. And it was awful, you know. Mm. But it wasn't their fault. They didn't get a sound check. Because mm. this represents that point of time in America, and things have developed a lot since then, really. And yeah. How did this this last tour compare? Well, the last um, see, we've done three tours since that book was written. We did mm. two, two, one with Mick Rouse, and then one with Ariel last summer, and then we just did another one with Ariel right. and Morgan Fisher and uh, Blue Weaver. Just um, each of these tours have been all headliners. And uh, of course it's changed because right. we don't have a lot of the problems that I talked about in that book. What I was trying to illustrate was, was that if you go to a gig, I know it's, you've paid your money and I know that you can't see the band. And if the sound is rotten and they're a support band, just think about it a little while because maybe they just didn't get a chance to get a sound check and things like that. All that was cancelled out when we became top of the bill, see? Mm. And uh, consequently we've gone down an awful lot better, you know. And. Uh, well, I can't, I can't tell you how well it goes down in America, because how many people are telling people how well they go down in America? <laughs> I'm going to say nothing. <laughs> Just if, it, if, it, if I, know, I know what's happening in America, and it's, it's great for the band, you know. To what extent do you get cocooned inside a tour? More yeah. and more, as you get up. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, inside a tour? Yeah. Yeah, well cocooned. Mm. Pretty well. You're a bit scared of anybody, because, especially in America, people who come on as intelligent within uh, five minutes will be freaks. It's weird, you know, you, talk, you start off a conversation with somebody who's intelligent, or you think who is intelligent, and then five minutes later you're trying to get rid of them, but it's too late then because you spoke to them, you know. Because mm. one of the things that occurred to me that I noticed so much about the book is how much time you all spend in hot shops. Right? Well, spend... we did, you know, fortunately, uh, you don't have to do so much now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Watts still does it. Watts is still around with Sterno and is going in every pawn shop all over the place. It was a laugh, because cause he went round all these pawn shops and picked up all his guitars, and we got to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and this kid, give me a Les Paul, so this was, this over and has been running around these pawn shops, trying to get his little deals going, and then this guy walked up and give it me. <laughs> it was really funny, because he took this guy out for a drink that night, <laughs> so he's open for one the next time, right? <laughs> How's the vendor fitting in now, then? Yeah. Well, he's all right, you know. I mean... Uh, He's got this nasty habit, uh, uh, he will come in the middle of the stage, you see. Now, the middle of the stage belongs to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he will sort of veer over, and I don't know if it's inte I don't know if he wants to be a star or, or, or whatever it is, but well, I've started hitting him of late, and it's still not doing much. He's covered in <laughs> bruises, but it's still not doing much good. I don't know if I like him or not. I mean, he's my best friend, but I don't know if I like him or not, you know. He's all right. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening now in the future with Marty? Uh, well, the, the last recordings that we did, um, the Hoople album and the singles that came off it, actually broke us a bit in Europe. We, we got a lot of top tens in Europe, which is an area we've never been to before. And we never wanted to go in unless it was on a level, because they're very peculiar people. 
you know. I mean, if you go in, like, uh, third on a bill or something, you get treated like cattle. You get treated really bad, and we'd sample this in the early days, so we figured we'd never go back unless we got hits. And now we've got the hits, we decided we'll have a look round over there and see what it's like, you know. Mm. And I think we're going back to the States in October, because there's still areas... Um, we gave a few promoters a bad time in Texas and around that area. We never turned up on, on a few occasions. It was their fault, they were bad promoters, but consequently you get banned from the place for a while. Mm. Well now it's open to us again, so I think in October we'll go maybe Texas and a bit of the south, cover a few areas that we've never been to, you know. Mm. Are you recording again soon? Uh, well, uh, Dale Griffin, Buff the drummer, uh, has just finished the live album. Half of it was recorded at the Hammersmith, you were there that night, mm. and the other half was recorded on Broadway. And it sounds great to me. I don't know what it's going to sound like. Uh, I don't think it's even being released here because I don't think there's uh, there's a big demand for it in America, but but not so much demand for a live album here. Mm. So uh, maybe it'll come out there and we'll see what happens with it later on here. Right, Ian Hunter. Thanks very much indeed. What a bar. We'll see you soon. <laughs>